Hi, it's Dr. Centeno. I'd like to talk about orthobiologics regulation, what you need to know. Basically, uh, this is the talk that I gave at the Tampa uh, AOM meeting. And if you weren't able to make it, uh, here it is. So these are my disclosures here. So how can I summarize this talk in one slide? Uh, as you uh, may or may not remember, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a show uh, called Lost in Space, and there was a robot, the one off on the left there, who used to run around saying, Danger Will Robinson, Danger Will Robinson. He was sort of the family robot, and he would uh, had a good relationship with the little kid, and he would protect the little kid. Now. Off on the right is the uh, 2018 version from the Netflix series Lost in Space. So the robot's gotten a big uh, upgrade here, but it's basically the same concept. And so I can summarize this whole talk in one slide by saying, Danger Will Robinson. How do you know when you are placing yourself at risk because you are believing a sales rep who is trying to sell you a product but you're about to get yourself in a lot of trouble or potentially could get yourself in a lot of trouble because you believed a sales rep. So why should I be giving this talk? Uh, I was the first idiot in the world to use culture expanded stem cells for orthopedic use. I was also the first to use bone marrow concentrate for many things, including intradiscal treatment, the lumbar spine, knee osteoarthritis, shoulder rotator cuff tears, etc. And hence one of our technologies resulted in a key case with FDA that was culture expanded cells defining what was and wasn't the practice of medicine. Now that patented culture technology is now part of an FDA approved phase two clinical trial. So I've seen both sides of this regulatory issue. So this is a topic where most physicians and sales reps just don't know what it is they don't know. However, you are responsible for knowing the law and claiming that you didn't know isn't a valid defense against penalties and federal prosecution. So as a physician, you need to know this stuff. So let's look at a historical regulatory timeline. So we have mass cell hearings that occur in the 1990s. Uh, we've got changes to 21 CFR 1271 that are made in the, the mid uh, 2000s, 2005, and they changed a single word that dramatically changed the implication of the law. Then there's the regenerative sciences case in the late 2000s, and then warning letters going out on stromovascular fraction from fat in 2000, starting in 2012, and then we've got FDA NIH hearings last year. And Gottlieb's, uh, the FDA commissioner's uh, press release on bad actors that were using stromal vascular fraction in patients. And then we've got the 21st Century Cures Act. And then we've got a recent letter by uh, Grassley uh, basically wanting blood on this whole issue. So the regulation you need to know is 21 CFR 1271, and it's off to the right there. And that's fairly complex, so I'm going to break it down and make it much easier. Bottom line is if what you produce in your office crosses the, quote, minimal manipulation line, then it's a drug. Now, you can cross that line a lot of different ways. So that's where you probably want to make sure you talk to a regulatory attorney about what you're doing. But it's basically a line in the sand type approach. For instance, culture expansion crosses that line, um, but just uh, centrifuging does not. So there's no protection because you're a doctor, nor because you perform the procedure in a medical setting, nor during the same surgical procedure. Meaning if what you're doing doesn't pass that minimal manipulation smell test, it doesn't matter that you're doing it in your office. And there's no protection because you have IRB approval. And another way to cross the line is not only in the processing, but you can cross the line by using tissue in a non-homologous way. So homologous use to FDA means basically that the way the body uses a certain tissue is the way you must use that tissue in your treatment. So examples of homologous use, uh, the FDA 
provide some for bone marrow concentrate uh, hematopoietic reconstitution. Uh, that would be obviously for use in, in neoplasm or cancer. Uh, for fat grafts, it's only subcutaneous to subcutaneous use, meaning that the FDA included uh, breast tissue as only for lactation. So augmenting breasts with a fat graft was considered non-homologous use. In addition, using fat in the knee is also currently considered non-homologous use. Bone marrow and orthopedics uh, has basically been given a pass for now. That could change uh, if the administration changes. And we believe that there's enough evidence that it's homologous to cartilage, muscle, tendon, and ligament. And we're working on an academic review paper right now on why this is so. We've gathered academics from Harvard and Emory and Stanford to be able to come together and say, uh, FDA, here's all the research that shows that uh, bone marrow concentrate is homologous for use in orthopedic care. And if you cross the line, you'll be viewed and inspected as a drug manufacturer. So what does being viewed as a drug manufacturer mean? Well, it means that you'll have to have a BLA or IND in place through the FDA. Uh, and just getting your protocol IRB approved means nothing. And you'll be held to a CGMP drug manufacturing standard. So your office will be inspected as if you are a Pfizer drug factory and there's no office on earth, medical office or hospital that will pass that test. So doesn't having IRB approval for a study get around all these regulations? If you're a doctor, you probably heard this uh, talked about, but the answer is absolutely not. Uh, in fact, it just means you're now violating both the FDCA and regulations promulgated by OHRP. So what types of orthobiologics are being used today for orthopedic injuries? Well, we've got allogeneic and we've got autologous. So we've got cord blood and amniotic uh, on the allogeneic side and autologous bone marrow concentrate uh, and adipose tissue. So if you look at autologous first, basically you've got uh, two bone marrow procedures, a same day centrifugation isolation of the Buffy coat, and that is currently given a pass. And then you've got culture expanding cells, which is clearly a drug. Uh, there are three different types of fat stem cell procedures. You've got a simple adipose graft, uh, microfragmented fat or lipogems would fit in here. And that's a tissue with no FDA approval. Then you've got stromovascular fraction, and that's where you enzyme digest the cells out of the fat, and that's a drug that does require full FDA approval. And then you've got, you can always culture adipose stem cells as well, and that's a drug. So the FDA right now has a real bugaboo with uh, stromovascular fraction from fat. So what is SVF? Basically, it's a mix of cells that contain mesenchymal stem cells uh, and a small percentage. There's lots of different cells in SVF. And it's created by digesting lipoaspirate with collagenase or another enzyme. Now, it's a bit of a mess with fat stem cells right now because when properly isolated, this is a drug, as I've said, and this applies even if you're processing fat at the bedside. And in August 2017, the FDA commissioner called these clinics, quote, bad actors, the ones that were treating chronic diseases this way. And some organizations claim this isn't the case, but beware, if you're caught doing this, you're going to be accused of the production of an illegal drug. And so this is a little bit more on uh, the new FDA commissioner, uh, Dr. Gottlieb's call out of bad actors. That's the New York Times article off on the right there. And basically clinics treating all sorts of diseases with uh, stem cells, there was an FBI raid on a California SVF clinic treating cancer. There was a warning letter to a Florida clinic that blinded three patients with adipose SVF. And Senator Grassley sent a letter last week basically wanting blood. He 
is asking the FDA to begin prosecuting these bad actors. So uh, I suspect we'll see some actions here on clinics, miracle cure clinics that are treating everything with stromal vascular fraction pretty soon. So one of these is a fat stem cell procedure, the other is not. So what I mean by this is that if you're making stromal vascular fraction and breaking down the fat to get the cells, then you've got uh, a drug and you can't do that. If you're just injecting a simple adipose graft or microfragmented fat, I'm gonna show you here that that's not a stem cell procedure, meaning it does not have any free available stem cells at all. So in 2012, we obtained uh, lipo aspirates and then ran these through a mechanical emulsifier. Uh, there were a lot of people doing that at the time, calling this a stem cell procedure, but it's not. We got no viable free stem cells out of this. The stem cells are still locked in their collagen prisons. And at the end of the day, what's interesting is that this is the same fat graft that's been done for 100 years. So I'm not quite sure how we can take something that's been done for a century or more in surgery and all of a sudden start calling it a stem cell procedure. That's just disingenuous. Then in 2014, we used this pretty cool uh, vibration-assisted liposuction machine. Uh, and the company claimed that it would be able to dissociate the cells from the collagen right in the body as you were taking the fat. The problem there is we got very few viable stem cells and far fewer than you could just get from bone marrow concentrate. So since liposuction is a more invasive procedure than just doing a bone marrow aspirate, we didn't see the need to do that. Now in 2017, we tested microfragmented fat in our lab. Uh, versus a simple modified mechanical emulsifier technique uh, that was developed by our scientists. Uh, and what was interesting was how poorly lipogems performed in isolating stem cells. And that's only interesting because uh, lipogems had a lecturer that was claiming that he saw stem cells climbing out of these little fat fuzz balls um, uh, in culture. And if that had happened, we would expect to see uh, stem cells in these experiments. But what we found was that we got very few viable stem cells, a tiny fraction of what you would get with bone marrow, and that's on the bottom there. Each one of those little uh, little circles represents a stem cell colony. So you can see the one on the bottom doesn't have many. The one on the top, which was that modified technique, had some viable stem cells, still a tiny fraction of what bone marrow had. Um, but there were some in there in a modified technique that was relatively inexpensive to perform. So let's look at allogeneic now, that's someone else's cells. So the most common issues uh, or tissues, sorry, being sold are amniotic fluid, amniotic membrane, umbilical cord blood, and Wharton's jelly. And IOF, uh, Interventional Orthopedic Society, has tested these tissues uh, I believe six or seven in total, and every single one, despite the companies claiming uh, live and viable cells, uh, has proved to be a dead cell product. And what's really bizarre is you see these white papers coming out from these, from these companies, and for the uneducated, these white papers look very impressive. They've got viability, uh, live dead stains. Sometimes they'll throw a little bit of... Uh, half-baked flow cytometry in there to make it look more impressive. And then some of them will even conclude that there's stem cells based on that flow cytometry. However, none of these white papers meet the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapy guidelines for actually confirming live and viable stem cells. I have yet to see any of these white papers do something this significant. So, what do they need to show in order to be credible? Well, not simple live dead stains. They need to show flow cytometry data that meets the fact standards. They need to show cells that survive in culture to form colonies that are adherent to plastic. And they need to show tri-lineage differentiation in culture, meaning cells that can differentiate, differentiate into fat, cartilage, and bone is usually what's considered appropriate. And if they do all that, then you can 
say with a straight face there are stem cells in the mix. But no one's doing it, even a fraction of that right now. And the flow cytometry that's being done is awful. To, just to tell you a little story, and you can read it on my blog, there was a company that produced a white paper that claimed that it had all these stem cells based on the flow cytometry data. We do a lot of flow cytometry, so I looked at the data and said, you can't get here from there. Uh, they didn't test the right markers. So I just cold called the guy at the university who uh, had signed the report. And it turns out that he did not conclude that there were stem cells in the sample that had been added later by somebody else, who I don't know. So none of these white papers meet the standards. In fact, they're filled with big, big holes. And then we get to the whole regulatory issue on these tissues. Are amniotic and cord, quote, stem cell products FDA approved? Now, I just showed you they don't have live and viable stem cells. And many claim that they have a stamp of approval from the FDA. But in fact, they are simple 361 registered tissues and not FDA approved. So there's two different pathways, a simple 361 tissue registration, which I'll show you here in a second, and a complex and expensive 351 cell drug approval, which is a very big deal and requires you know 10 years of testing and uh, tens of millions of dollars per clinical indication so what's involved in getting a 361 tissue registration basically this is the actual form that you go online and and fill out it's a free registration it takes 45 minutes to do you check some boxes and you're done that's why we see so many of these companies springing up the regulatory burden is obnoxiously low. Unlike a drug where it is obnoxiously high, it's the opposite of a cell drug. So basically uh, these companies, all they need to do, it's on the honor system is to fill out the form and that's it, they're good to go. So that's why we're seeing this occur. Now what happens if one of these companies claims it has live cells? Well, that little, uh, paragraph in the 1271 regulation states that if you've got live cells, you're not a 361 tissue, i.e. the 45 minute online registration. In fact, you've got to go through the 351 cell drug pathway, which is the big one where you've got tens of millions, so have to spend tens of millions of dollars over a number of years to do clinical trials for every clinical indication. So most of these companies, well, all of them that are claiming live cells, have misidentified how to regulate their product, and many of them have gotten warning letters based on it, and you'll, I think we'll see many more warning letters coming out. So again, these are cell drugs, they are not registered tissues. Now, and that, just wanna back up for a second because that really is agnostic as to whether they actually have stem cells. They may all be dead products. Certainly the ones we've tested are dead products. And it's the claim that makes them a drug. So do you have any legal liability as the doctor who uses an illegal biologic drug? If these things are misbranded uh, and mislabeled. And the answer is based on section 301 of the FDCA, you are liable. Uh, basically just the receipt of something like this, and certainly the promotion of it makes you as liable as the manufacturer. And which physicians right now are sitting in federal prison for violating this law? Those that promoted an illegal drug product via seminars. Does that sound familiar? If you're a doctor and you buy this stuff and you go out and hold a patient seminar or a seminar for your referral sources claiming that you are performing a live stem cell injection, you are as liable as the manufacturer who mislabeled it. So scenario one, uh, you order and pay for an amniotic or cord blood product because it claims it has live cells in an email, um, but it, it's actually an adulterated misbranded drug product. You hold a stem cell seminar for patients and local referral sources, so you become liable under section 301 of the FDCA. 
And as discussed previously, culture expanded cells are also drugs. And the reason I bring this up is we have several companies right now claiming to be able to culture your patient cells and store them. Is this legal? And the answer is absolutely not. So scenario number two is you send a bone marrow or a fat sample to be cultured to a manufacturer's site as part of what you're told is an IRB approved study and you pay for and inject those expanded cells in a patient. Again, you're liable under section 301 of the FDCA for using a misbranded and adulterated drug knowingly because you're supposed to know this stuff. So you cannot do this. And if someone tells you you can, run the opposite direction as fast as you can. So again, if a company wants to culture your patient stem cells, they'll need to show you a separate biologics license for each clinical application, one for knee osteoarthritis, one for shoulder rotator cuff tears, one for hip osteoarthritis, etc. cetera. Uh, and none of these companies have these, they don't exist. So if someone tells you this, just run. If a company claims to be selling live cells at all, i.e. in a vial, ask to see their FDA drug approval documents, not their simple 361 online registration. They should have years of extensive clinical data to show you. Um, and if they don't have that, then again, run. There are companies out there that are playing the straight uh, that use amniotic tissue uh, and sell amniotic tissue and they don't claim any live cells. Uh, these companies are just straight up doing it correctly and go buy the stuff from one of those companies where you won't get in trouble, but don't buy it from a company claiming live cells because that puts you at significant legal liability. So again, don't end up in federal prison or defending yourself from a federal indictment because you believed what a sales rep said. Do your own homework. So what can we do now to protect this field going into the future? How do we, how do we come together as physicians to make sure that we can continue to do certain things? Well, one of the more important focuses there is how to prevent orthopedic bone marrow concentrate from falling into the regulatory abyss. And I think it's the four P's. Number one, partition, separate orthobiologics from the miracle cure stem cell clinics. PR, educating the world about the benefits. Pressure, uh, patients and stakeholders need to organize and bring pressure to bear on legislators and then publish, uh, i.e. we're doing that big review article right now to basically show FDA the data that's already out there that shows that using their own regulations, bone marrow concentrate would be homologous for orthopedic use. And most importantly, make sure you know when to say danger Will Robinson. That's it. Thanks so much uh, for watching and have a great day.